All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Unsiloing Your Project Team with Collaborative Sketches and Digital Prototyping. We're going to be talking a bit about how you can use uh, collaborative sketches and digital prototyping to supplement your existing UX approach and how doing this can benefit your project team, your clients, and your company. So we'll be talking a bit about how we made the change, uh, what challenges we were trying to address originally, how we incorporated uh, these two approaches into our existing approach, and finally the success stories and benefits that we've had during this. First, a little bit about us. We come from a DC-based firm, uh, Rock Creek Strategic Marketing, and uh, I'm Kat Cool, our Director of Technology. With me are Ika Lestari, our Senior Graphic Designer, and Michelle Chin, our Senior UX Strategist. We put this presentation together to show how this approach could benefit uh, three main groups of people, UXers and designers who get more engagement from other people on their project team up front, developers who tend to have more well thought out requirements by the time this reaches the development phase and who can have early input into some of the deliverables that they might have had changes to if they would had an opportunity to review them, and project managers who tend to get better thought out products early in the project timeline and who can have savings in their timelines when this is implemented. We put this together to address some of the challenges of uh, our previous approach, which had been using only wireframing. While we still use wireframing selectively, we found that using wireframes only can lead to some problems because of the way the process works. By default, you're going to have a UXer who spends some time putting together wireframes, revising them, presenting them to the client, revising them, and has that happen a few times according to how many revision rounds are specified in your contract. This leads to lots of revisions, and ultimately we act like we're trying to make a static artifact perfect with our uh, performing wording changes and tweaking that really could be done during the development and design phases of the project because we want to get this right. It's the deliverable the client is expecting, it's in our contract, and it takes on more importance than at times it necessarily should have. We also find that when you're working in a siloed environment where the UXer makes uh, wireframes, hands them off to the designer, they get handed off to the developer and ultimately uh, put into QA, there are lots of handoffs that happen along this process. There are lots of opportunities where the UXer might be saying, I really want it to work this way, telling the designer that. The designer passes it along to the front-end developer, gets passed along to the back-end developer as well, and you end up playing a game of telephone because you're trying to com uh, communicate complex functionality with what boils down to a paper concept. Because you're having a lot of revisions and a lot of handoffs, you're going to have a lack of engagement throughout the project from people who don't get involved quite as early as they should. This is a problem because when everyone on the team understands what's happening at the project, there's opportunity for, uh, for input. Your accessibility analyst might end up red flagging the fact that uh, that map concept you just proposed is going to have some serious challenges for keyboard-only users and that you need to invest time up front thinking about a fallback. Your designer might say that that approach you're putting into place is really going to look difficult, really challenging on a mobile phone to get that much information on the screen. And your developer might say that that's going to take a lot of time and effort to uh, implement the way that you've laid it out, but that with some few small tweaks, it could be a lot more uh, easy to do within your existing timeline. When these people don't get an opportunity to contribute to the project until later, you miss the opportunities to hear your subject matter experts give this kind of feedback and incorporate it into what you're putting forward. This is something that's faced us broadly as a company, but there are also uh, other changes that have faced individual teams. Probably the most frustrating part for developers is that we end up having a lengthy wireframe phase, followed by a lengthy design phase, and then an equally lengthy development phase that we're cramming quite a lot into. You end up doing your site building, module installation, module development, theming, and migration, all in a fairly small window of what can be a significantly long project. This means that you're crunching a lot of things in at the end that you could be starting a lot sooner when you're planning for them. And it also means that when you get down to crunch time, there are going to be some things that are overlooked that wouldn't have been overlooked if you'd been spending more time with the development along the way. The other development challenge that we've had a lot is hearing the phrase, but now that I see it, once things are actually taking shape. If you're working on something responsive, there's no way that a wireframe or even a design can communicate the full scope of the functionality you're going to be putting into place. Even with heavy annotations, annotations can be misinterpreted, and people have uh, assumptions that don't always necessarily connect during this time. Your designer might think that you're going to have a great-looking design on this mobile phone, a great-looking one on this tablet, and Fablet's probably going to work itself out, more or less. 
So when they end up seeing what their responsive site looks like on a phablet, they can be a little bit horrified. And you're, uh, you might have missed connections as well between your UXers and your developers about how things are actually going to be powered during this phase. So for designers, even though we were involved during kickoff, we don't really come in until mid-stage of the project. And what that means is we often end up asking a lot of questions about why are things being placed in that, ma in that location? Why are things supposed to function this way? So we find that we waste a lot of time just trying to play catch up. Um, and instead of doing the real design work, we just try to gather a lot of information. Also, having to deliver a JPAC mockup, it's really easy to misinterpret functionality because it is nothing that's fully functional. You don't really design something that's for a browser. It's really hard to be transparent about how visually, how your visual elements are supposed to work when it comes to functionality. And when it comes to responsive designs, you have, let's say if you have a carousel design that's really elaborate on your 27-inch um, monitor. If you have this mashup of like two images together and you have header text, you have caption, and also uh, a link on top of that, it doesn't really translate as well when it comes to mobile. So you spend a lot of time and effort just getting buy-ins from time members because you do have to spend a lot of time explaining what your vision is. How do you want these visuals to work? And you just have to make sure that everybody is on the same page about how your visuals are going to work. So from a UX standpoint, um, I often face challenges that include designing wireframes in a vacuum. I have to get my concepts down on paper, and I have to get them far enough along so a developer can understand what I'm trying to explain. And that often takes a lot of time. Not only that, I create high fidelity wireframes, and these wireframes are pretty complicated. So I have a lot of interaction, a lot of details list listed in them. So when they go to review, um, maybe a developer has a suggestion, say we'll have to use another module instead, I actually have to go back and updating them. And that's a lot of work. So that, that can be a little taxing for me. Um, as you can see, I heavily annotate wireframes. I'll add lots of, because these are paper-based wireframes, they're static and they have no interaction, I have to annotate all the interactions. So I have to say what's going to happen when you roll over one item, what happens when you click the submit button. I have to do a lot of explanation and I, do my, I take my time trying to explain all these interactions so everyone can understand them. But even with the hefty annotations, they still get misinterpreted. Sometimes dev might misinterpret what I said wrong um, and, I'll, you know, and the design, designer will feel the same way. Um, and it's really frustrating for all parties involved. In terms of accessibility, wireframe concepts make it difficult to identify accessible trouble spots. So we can go ahead and wireframe something out and the accessibility, an accessibility analyst will say, yeah, I think theoretically that's going to be accessible. This should be cool. All right, awesome. So then we go on, get sign off from the client, and then we go to development. And all of a sudden when we're developing it, we realize it's not exactly accessible. So it's the 11th hour, we're having to find an alternative or adjust things, and that's just adding more stress to everyone. All right, so with all these UX challenges, dev challenges, design challenges, accessibility challenges, you know, we thought maybe there's some other way that we can do this. What, what's something else that we can do? But first, what did we really need? We needed something easier to understand. We also needed something quicker to iterate upon. Something more realistic something that involves everyone earlier. So what could that be? For us, it turned out to be collaborative sketching and digital prototyping. So collaborative sketching brings everyone on board, your entire team on board earlier on in the process. And digital prototyping presents something that's easy and very realistic to understand. So we'll talk about how we got to the collaboration process and how you can implement that at your company. So first off, it's a little bit of a paradigm shift. Uh, making the change to collaboration involves a lot of steps, and here are some of them. So you want to pick a small project, and not just, um, you know, it could be a small website or a smaller portion of a bigger website. And you want to pick something that's small because it's less risky. When it's less risky, more people are willing to try it out. It's also manageable in size, so you don't want to bite off more than you can chew when you're trying something new. 
because if all else fails, if this collaboration exercise doesn't work out, you still have some time, it's quicker to recover. You also wanna get buy-in from your teammates. So what I did when we tried this project out, I went to everyone on the team and said, hey, would you be up for trying out this sketching approach? I think it might help us. I think it might make things easier. And people actually were really into it. Even people who I thought weren't gonna be into it were really up for trying this out. All right, so who do you wanna involve? You actually wanna involve everyone. That includes UXers, developers, designers, accessibility analysts, content strategists, project managers, everyone. This way you get everyone started on the same page and you guys, you guys can get a glimpse of what everyone else does. So for example, the project manager, when we tried the sketching, she was just like, wow, I've never tried wireframing. Now I kind of get why it's really challenging. And when Kat provides a solution to a really complicated problem instantly, I'm like, wow, I don't really have a programmer's brain. I can definitely appreciate her insight. All right, so you also want to set expectations when you're establishing this process. Um, you want to tell people sketching is going to lead to a prototype. It's going to be different. There's not going to be any paper wireframes. And let's face it, uh, wireframes are only great for UXers. Could you make, this could make your life easier, maybe. You know, we're all trying something new to make improvements to our process. But since it's new, it could be a bumpy road. But that's okay, everyone's willing to try it, so let's get pumped. All right, so how do we sketch collaboratively? There's a couple things, and I'll go into the stuff that you need. When to sketch, what to sketch, how to sketch, and some pro tips on sketching and leading the, dis leading the discussions. So what you'll need, you'll need markers, all colors, sizes, everything, paper, eight and a half by 11 to 11 by 17 paper, lots of paper, because um, this is a sketching activity. Masking tape to post up the designs to a wall. Scissors, some people make mistakes and like to cut them out. Sticky notes, because some people make mistakes and like to cover them up. That's my poor personal choice. Snacks, so this is a new process for everyone, and in, or in order to get them kind of relaxed, we provide food. Um, we also provide music, because we want them to be into doing this activity, and we kind of want to, you know, take away some of the apprehension that they might have. So choosing the right space. When you choose a space to do these sketching sessions, you want an open area, something that has plenty of space where you can stick up designs, and you want it freedom, free from distractions. So here we are as our conference room with a big whiteboard wall, and we're all sketching together and posting our designs up. So what are you gonna sketch? And this is where the UXer comes in. You take your site map and evaluate the site map. You wanna look for things like main pages, like a home page, landing page. You wanna do pages with unique features and functionality, so anything that might be complicated or something that could really be really cool, like a gallery and responsive design versions of the above. So you wanna keep that in mind. You wanna avoid like saying, oh, we're gonna sketch this like interior page, because interior pages, you know, some basic interior pages are kind of boring. All right, so when are you gonna sketch? And I like to do a three-part process. So the first part is the pre-sketch meeting. It's about 30 minutes long. I like to actually do this on a Friday um, and then have people have the weekend to think about it and then start sketching on the Monday. So in the pre-sketch meeting, we'll just go over some ideas and some basics about what they're to expect when you actually do the sketching. So the second part would be the actual sketching sessions. I'll start off small and have like an hour and a half to two hour sketching session, and if needed, we'll add another sketching session. Um, some people like to do like eight hour sketching sessions. That gets to be really long and really tiring, especially if you're trying out a new process. So you wanna start small. You can always add more sketching sessions on if you need it. And lastly, after the sketching, we do a discussion session. And again, I break that up into an hour and a half to two hours long. And sometimes we might have an extra discussion session if we still need to have more discussion. All right, so the pre-sketching meeting. During this meeting, you're gonna set expectations. You wanna talk about what site you're sketching, the goals of the sketching, the types of pages you're gonna be sketching, and also, if you're trying out this process for the first time, you wanna to explain to your team members what's gonna happen in these sessions. So you're gonna say, you know, we're doing this meeting now, we're gonna do some sketching, and then after that, we'll follow up with some discussion. Also, during this pre-sketch meeting, I provide background information. So that includes stuff like the site map, so they can get a lay of the land of how the site's gonna work and the pages that they're sketching. I'll list the pages that they're gonna sketch, but I'll also add features that should go on those pages. So I'll say keep in mind, you know, at the home page, we need to have a Twitter feed, an events feed, and a recent blog posts feed. 
I'll also include any user research, so like personas, scenarios, anything that can give them an idea of who the users of the site will be. And previous project work. So one of our clients is Education Pioneers, and prior to that, we had done a lot of print collateral for them, and they wanted us to do their website redesign. So I took a lot of the print collateral, brought it to this meeting, and showed everyone, hey, this is kind of the look and feel that they're going for. This is the kind of you know, tone that they're taking with their, their material, so let's transfer this to the website. All right, so now we had the, the pre-sketch pre meeting, and now we're on to the sketching. So here's a picture of us sketching wildly. There's music going on, snacks to be had, lots of sketching. So we'll go ahead and sketch a couple ideas. We don't have to sketch every home or every page indicated in the sketching session. Some people will pick two or three to sketch. Some people will try to do all of them. After you, after you make a sketch, you post it on the wall. And you might be thinking, well, if I told people what pages they need to sketch and what should be on them, aren't you going to get the same sketches. Sometimes you'll get some duplicate sketches, but sometimes you'll get other ideas. So for example, we had an upcoming meetings page, and a lot of us sketched grid calendars, and then some of us sketched list view. So you do get quite a variety. So we'll do some more sketching, and it's a very iterative process, lots of back and forth, and it's pretty fun. Here are some pro tips for sketching. You want to encourage everyone to sketch. This is going to be something new to a lot of people. Some people might be intimidated because they're sitting next to UXers and they're sitting next to designers. They're like, oh, you know, I don't want to have to pick up a marker in front of them. They're going to critique. They're going to judge. I know this. Um, creating a relaxed environment, encouraging everyone really helps. And remember that no idea is a bad one. So maybe you have someone that's sketching out a video gallery and you're a project manager going, oh my gosh, we don't have any budget for video. We can't use that sketch. You know what? You can repurpose that sketch. So maybe instead of using a video gallery, you have a photo gallery instead. And one of the biggest things for sketching is pay attention to everyone's energy level. If you've scoped out an hour and a half sketching session, but people are starting to fade after 45 minutes, maybe you cut that sketching session short and regroup again later on in the afternoon or the next day. Um, you really want everyone's engagement because this is really important to have them all on the same page and not really hating what they're doing. All right, so we're on to the discussion session, and here we have everyone's designs posted. So what are we going to do with this? For, for, to facilitate discussion, we all pick a page. So say we'll start with a home page, and we'll go over ideas. So it's kind of like a show and tell. We'll, everyone will stand by their idea and say, well, I have a carousel doing this. I have a Twitter feed here. I have this functionality. And we kind of explain how things are going. People can ask questions. You know, what did you mean by this? You know, what happens when you click this link? After we go over all the discussion or, or all the ideas, we'll pick one sketch. Um, maybe one sketch isn't perfect, so we'll end up taking parts of some. And we'll kind of put together the best of to make something really cool. It's a little Frankensteining, and that might make people, some people nervous. But that's where the UXer comes in. So the UXer should really use your UX skills. You want to make sure that all the ideas are being properly vetted, that they're using good UX practices and that they're presenting a comprehensive functionality. And also, it's really important that someone take notes. There's a lot of discussion that goes on, a lot of ideas that get yayed, and a lot of ideas that get nayed very instantaneously and change directions very quickly. So it's really important that you have someone taking notes to figure out what the final uh, determinations were. Some pro tips for discussion. So UXer and project manager, use your facilitation skills. This is a great way to practice facilitating group discussions. Um, and it's also really important to make sure that everyone is heard. This is a collaborative event. Uh, you definitely want to make sure everyone is heard so they can get more buy-in and more say with what's going on. And this is probably the biggest part of discussion, is vet the ideas with your teammates. So we're all in the room together. We are all sharing ideas. And so rather than you know walking over to my desk like in a traditional method of having to wait and pass emails back and forth, I can ask my developer right then and there, hey, can we do this in the time frame? And they can say yes or no. The accessibility person can flag it saying, I think we're going to have to adapt it for better accessibility. All the experts are in the room right there. They have a say, and we can navigate the challenges very early. So what's next? After we've discussed stuff, it's your turn to have the UX designer take those ideas. And what I'll usually do is create lo-fi reference sketches for the developer. So this usually means I'll take you know, whatever the sketches are, maybe take some post-it notes and annotate what, we're what we finally decided. Or um, if I feel that it's easier, I'll take, um, make really low, low fidelity uh, omnigraphal sketches. 
and just make annotations for the developer. So the developer was already um, in the sketching session, so they pretty much know what to prototype, but this is a good final reference checklist. This isn't actual client deliverable, it's just an internal resource. And then I'll take those sketches, and then I'll work in tandem with the developer to begin building the prototype. So as you're hearing about this, you might be wondering whether we never wireframe. That isn't the case. Wireframes are a communication tool, and when used properly, they're a good way to get sign-off and a good way to uh, spell out what's required for different ideas. If we're going to be uh, prototyping, if we're going to be uh, doing the UX for a mobile app that's going to have a lot of functionality that would be extremely difficult to quickly prototype, we'll put together a wireframe for that functionality. If we have a very contentious homepage that we know is going to go through a lot of changes at the point when the client sees it, and we'd rather go ahead and block out the major elements on paper, we can do that. What we do try to stay away from is creating a lot of wireframes for different sections of the site that would be much faster to prototype with proper site building. Ultimately, wireframes are a quick and dirty communication tool that are going to give you a lot of connection with your client if you do show it to them, but they don't think out everything. And you need to make sure that when you're building out an interactive site, you're paying attention to the medium you're going to wind up working with. I really liked this quote from uh, Brad Frost recently about the static artifacts kind of clouding the fact that you're ultimately designing for a real website. When you hover over that dropdown, something's going to happen. When you click that photo, it's going to get bigger. When you play a video, it's going to respond. And that's not going to happen on your wireframes unless you are crazy good at wireframing. So uh, ultimately, we want to get people into the browser as soon as possible and have these connections start getting made in an interactive way. Uh, some people like HTML prototypes. There was a point when we worked on these. We were attracted to them because they're quick to build. Once you start putting content on the page, you add in your HTML elements, add classes, style those classes, add in some JavaScript functionality. It's not instantaneous, but it is pretty quick and pretty efficient initially. The problem is that they're not underpinned with any sort of content management. So when you need to go in and make changes based on your usability testing or based on internal review, it's pretty painful to change 30 different pages in a prototype, especially when the way that you're changing things is changing across all of them at once. If you're linking to an event and you're uh, initially not providing a description when you do your event linkages and then you realize you really should, it's going to take you a while to go back and add that everywhere an event is featured. And that uh, additional time you're going to be spending is extremely frustrating because you know that at the end of the day, you're building something throwaway. You're not going to be reusing this code in a meaningful way in your final product because while you might have some semantic elements and classes that you can move forward in the process, your designer is probably going to change a lot of things during the design phase, and you might end up doing a lot of recoding anyway. By contrast, if you are making a Drupal prototype, it's going to be slower to build up front. You're going to sink a lot of time into site building. But you're also going to find that now it's being underpinned by a real content management system. So when you need to change something, you can do it quickly. If you need to reorder the blocks on all the pages that are news release template at once, you can just do that. If you need to go ahead and change how your views work by adjusting a view mode, you can change it once and have it update everywhere it's being used in your prototype. As you might imagine, you're going to be sinking a lot of time into this, so it's a good thing that it is laying the groundwork for your site. You're going to keep using it as you move through the process. And when you finish the UX phase, you're not just going to have a prototype or a wireframe. You're going to have the beginnings of your site built. This is great because it means that as you move forward, you can start immediately doing content migration. You can immediately work on some back-end functionality you might need to build a custom module for. You're not emerging from it with an idea. You're emerging from it with groundwork. The last time we did an HTML prototype was for the Federal Trade Commission Center, the uh, Federal Trade Commission site that we launched in December. This was a, a pretty comprehensive HTML prototype that had about uh, 30 pages in it. As you can see here, it's got a lot of dynamic content being pulled in. This is the news and events page, so it shows uh, the news and further below this, some of the events. And they're also featured in the right sidebar, the very important upcoming events. You also have a content being pulled in in the dropdown and featured at, throughout other places of the site. So if you're reusing your news releases and your events elsewhere, then you're going to need to be updating that. We have topic pages that also reference these. And every time that you load in a news release or add in a new news release to your prototype, you'd have to make sure that it's getting added to the relevant pages. Uh, we did build this out. We had a successful usability testing phase. And when we met, went back and made modifications, it's fairly time consuming. 
the lesson we took away from this process was that doing these prototypes in the content management system you're going to ultimately be building them in gives you a lot of time and efficiency that you're saving. Uh, for the Commission of Fine Arts, which we're going to be talking about a little bit later, uh, we built out a fully functional prototype, all the content types, taxonomies, and views, uh, and uh, masonry photo gallery and some map functionality in about two days and put that in front of the client with great results. They were thrilled with it, and we were able to let them navigate through the prototype and the pages of content that we'd loaded in a fairly organic, realistic way. So at the point when they signed off, they had a really great sense of how their site was going to work, not just what it was going to look like. Uh, another great thing we found uh, as we're implementing this is that you're going to end up seeing your timelines look a lot different. Uh, unlike the original timeline we showed where you have your development kind of happening at the end, this way you have your development spread out through the process and collaboration points throughout that. So during the prototype phase, you're collaborating heavily with your UXer and your designer and everyone else on your team. And you're doing your site building, your module installation, and a little bit of migration so that you can support these content types and make sure that they make sense. This lays the groundwork for you to do a much heavier migration phase during the design part of the timeline. So as your designer's working on tweaking the final look and feel of it, you're making sure that you actually have the functionality built out and that it's working really well. It gives you a lot more opportunities for testing. Then when you get to your development phase, which as you can see is now a little bit shorter, you can handle your theming and your module development, uh, anything else that you need to do, and you have more time for testing and QA. There is a warning that goes along with this though. Because you are not throwing away this product when you're done, it gives you a tremendous amount of responsibility to get rid of the things you don't need. So when you're prototyping and you're saying, I think the piece of content, uh, I think this content type would work really well if it had an event association, then you realize later that if you put uh, the association on the event content type and point it to the news release, it's going to work better. You owe it to yourself to go back and remove what didn't work out. You also need to make sure that if you installed several different modules that do the same thing, you turn them off and uninstall them when you're done. This means that you'll end up having a better product and you're doing the same kind of curation that you would be doing on your final site because this is going to become your final site. As we're creating digital prototypes, uh, just like creating a Drupal site, it's going to fall into a handful of uh, buckets with one notable exception. We have front-end tasks, site building tasks, and content mi migration tasks, but not back-end tasks during this time because we don't want to be sinking time into doing a lot of custom module development during this phase. The intent is still to have a fairly quick touch point for your client to take a look at, not to have your entire site complete during this point. Your front-end tasks should be fairly minimal. You'll go ahead and install a prototype theme. You don't want to be doing too much customization to it because your designer is then going to have all kinds of changes. And we usually tend to install a bootstrap, something like that, that we're not going to put in our final build, but it quickly gives us a professional look and feel to show the client and make sure that they're going to be pleased with what they're seeing as opposed to turning on, uh, bordering all the boxes in Zen. During this, you want to consider your source order and your positioning making sure that you understand how your sidebars are going to degrade during the design phase and giving your designer some structure to work with. This is a heavily collaborative effort between the developer, the UXer, and the designer because it's a pretty major decision point whether your sidebar is going to end up rolling down beneath your content, whether your menu is going to roll up above your content. You want to start answering some of these questions now. And you're going to sink some time into adjusting the mobile experience as needed. So if you're using a prototype theme that doesn't really handle your mobile menu very well, this is a good time to make sure that uh, you tweak that before the client sees it so that you can give that organic experience of resizing the browser and having them understand roughly how it's going to end up working. Your site building tasks are slightly more intense. The first is that you need to build out the site map and your menu structure. Uh, doing these menus is going to be a lot, uh, a lot faster if you use a module that will allow you to uh, place content within the menu without actually migrating that content up front. I like the module special menu items because it allows you to put non-linked items in your menu and then clearly know you need to go back and load that in later. You'll set up your content types, your taxonomies, and your views during this and make sure that you're setting up those fields on the content types in a way that you can live with later. So uh, this is where you're going to add uh, a lot of functionality that's going to get reused, and you can see it taking shape in front of you. 
We came out of our last prototyping effort with uh, nine content types, 10 views, and five taxonomies built out fully so that we could continue iterating on them during the rest of our effort. We like to make persistent block associations whenever possible, so that as you're doing the site building that's going to make different blocks appear on, say, your news releases. When you change themes later, those uh, associations are going to stick around. I like context for this personally, because uh, if you're going to place them with the core Drupal functionality, as soon as you switch your theme, all your block associations are going to go away. You'll set up your aliases and breadcrumbs during this so that you can see where your uh, content is going to end up living and how people are going to navigate between it. So if you have uh, your news events path set up so that it's just content slash title, that's not really useful for anyone and it doesn't reflect how people are going to navigate in your site. Spending the time to set that up and make sure your breadcrumbs are functional here is going to give a great authentic experience of how people are going to interact with it long term, and it's going to force you to address uh, any logic errors you've made if you said that your news releases were going to have a path that put them under about, but you forgot to stick them there. This is where you're going to be able to catch that very easily. And of course, you'll install modules to provide more complex functionality. Some modules are very basic, and they're always going to be on your site, like views. Others are going to be added to uh, prop up some of the functionality that you might be building out even further late later. For example, uh, in one version of the site, we had a calendar that we knew we were going to end up doing a bunch of custom work with to leverage the Calendario library. But uh, we just put in the generic views calendar for our prototype because there was really no need to get to that level in our prototype. It was something we could iterate on later with the client as we got them introduced into it. During this phase, I do tend to use the occasional alpha or beta module so long as I'm flagging it for later and we know very clearly when it's going to be removed and are keeping some way to track that so you don't have direct winding up in your final product. Uh, this is a screenshot from uh, the prototype we're doing for the Federal Trade Commission site. You'll notice it is not black and white like a wireframe because we're building inside uh, the theme for the main FTC.gov that we'd already done. What this does is uh, add in the main elements that are going to be in the final product. It's extremely functional. We went ahead and imported content before we did just about anything else. And uh, this helped us catch some logic problems really early in the process. So under here, you see uh, you might also like, along with a short description that was in the content we originally provided. And I talked to, to the UXer a lot about this because having related content appear here is no small feat. And I initially got the response that uh, it was going to work based on taxonomy. So uh, we looked at the taxonomy to see if it was going to support some relevant associations here. Because uh, there was a fairly, a fairly large taxonomy and a fairly small number of publications, we ended up seeing a lot of reuse of that taxonomy so that what would have appeared here if we just said show things tagged with the same items, it wouldn't have really been coherent and it wouldn't have uh, populated the right content onto the page. So we took this back to the client, asked them how they would like to have this function, and it turned out they actually wanted complete fine-tuned control over this. So instead, we have a node reference that points to what publications are associated with this publication. This is something that we wouldn't have found out if we'd just been looking at a wireframe. We were confronted with it early, and we were able to work with the client to make sure that they knew how they were going to be putting content in here, and that if they wanted to set it up like this, they needed to provide that information. Things like this only work really well if you're looking at real content. So the most important thing we do during our prototype, arguably, is to migrate content, all the content. Uh, we put in many pieces of content for each content type, and if we have access to a database we can simply import, we go ahead and do that to the extent that we can with uh, scripts or with feeds occasionally. So uh, this is going to make it so that when you're looking at this product, you have a very realistic idea of what your, content's con what your client's content is going to look like when it goes into your prototype. Now, inevitably, you are going to end up putting in some lorem ipsum as you're building this out. I, we try to avoid this really, really hard. But uh, if you are knowing that you're going to put in some test content, I like to add a Boolean checkbox value to the content type just for test content so that I can check that off and then go back and remove it all later. That way you have it tracked and you don't run the risk of having it wind up there when you really weren't intending for it to happen. So we'll talk about some of the success stories we've had with this approach. Uh, probably one of the bigger ones uh, was the Federal Trade Commission site. This is the original site that they did. The prototype we put together, and as I mentioned, this one was an HTML prototype. 
and the final site that we ended up with. And the reason we're talking about this, even though it had an HTML prototype, when really what we're advocating is a Drupal prototype, is that the reason this effort was successful is that we did a ton of Drupal prototyping along the way. We did our initial uh, 30 wireframes, but at the time when this site launched, it had about 60,000 nodes of content and many different landing pages, all, a lot of them with unique searching and filtering functionality. We'd rolled in some external databases that really expanded and were tweaked to take advantage of the new Drupal content management system. This was challenging because uh, with that much variation happening in the site, the fact that we had so many content stakeholders became kind of an issue. There are many people who are subject matter experts in the FTC content within the FTC, and all of them had uh, thoughts about how their content should look. So rather than trying to make assumptions based on the wireframes that weren't complete for the sections that we were showing, we worked with them to uh, prototype in Drupal, present it, explain how it would be maintained and what kind of features we built in to make management a little bit easier for them and have them come away with it with a good understanding of how the site was going to work. In a lot of cases, we showed this to them and found that uh, there were certain distinctions between pieces of content that we wouldn't have come up with organically and that we needed to tell them uh, we need to work with them to find out how they would be pulled out in the content in the final product. This has been a really successful engagement for us, and as we've moved on to doing additional sites for the FTC, like the commerce site that we're rolling into their site now, uh, we've relied increasingly on prototyping, wireframing out complex pages like the home page or things that would be very uh, difficult to prototype quickly, like a modified checkout process, but leaving prototyping to do the rest like the faceted uh, filtering for the publications, the publication view itself, and the language switching between these. All right, so um, for one of my projects, uh, I worked on Education Pioneers, which is a nonprofit uh, placement um, organization that has a fellowship and um, partnerships that they pair uh, potential fellowship fellows with. We originally had a nine-month uh, timeline, which already seemed pretty compressed, but then that got squeezed even more narrow into a six-month time frame. So that's how this digital prototype really helped us. It helped us get further faster. We quickly sketched some ideas and then threw that into a prototype, which laid the groundwork for the actual site. Another benefit of this was um, to demonstrate our client uh, to our client that there was a lot of uh, cross-referencing from pages to pages. So, you know, city pages would show up their fellow, display their fellows and upcoming events related to that. And they had a hard time understanding that that's how the approach we were going to take with the site. But once they saw the prototype, they got it. Oh, I see. You know, these events that are related to the Bay Area are going to show up on only on this page. Yes. Um, and only the people that went to the Bay Area are going to show up on the page. So it really helped them understand how their content was going to be used throughout their site. So another example that we did digital prototyping for was for U.S. Commission of Fine Arts. This is actually their current site, and as you could see, it's very static. So we thought having a digital prototype would really help them kind of transitioning towards the more dynamic content and kind of reel them in during the transition process. So this was the digital prototype that we have. Internally, we made sure that we strip off any visual elements that say we make sure everything is very gray, there is no color elements, and even for fonts, we make sure everything is very basic. We don't, have, we don't want any elements that the client will kind of get hung up upon. Even for little things like the logos, we did not want them to kind of focus on that, and they, we really want them to make sure that all the structure on the home page is clear to them. So with this, we also have an upfront discussion internally that there's nothing that designers can't change. We could still move around the positioning, and having all this structure established upfront, we were able to kind of push the design to the next level. So we had to actually present three different designs. This was one of them. So we were still able to push it, and we, we kind of curate more on the user experience. What could we do to kind of push their site to the next level? So we come up with three different with the carousel where we have a little bit of the next and previous slide, and we, where users could have that bigger experience of what the agency is really about. The next design is really different. Instead of having the bigger image, we have a set of thumbnails, and it's very open and minimalist. And the next one, we actually tie in all the content with a bigger image, a bigger, bigger visual component, and we were able to bring three different design solutions 
that wasn't at all tied in to the prototype, and that was great. So the benefits of collaborative sketching and digital prototype is, one, you are able to navigate challenges early. Since we no longer work in our own little corners, we're actually able to talk to each other more openly. Uh, we, could, we don't wait till issues to come up during 11th hour. We could tell them, oh, what happened if we want to do this FAQ and there's no content? All those issues actually come up front. And we could iterate more quickly on the design concept. We no longer have to come up with a new design component on a layout. Since all of those little things were already established, we could actually focus more on the UI elements. And if you're doing your prototype in Drupal, you could actually reuse your work. Since you already have your views, content types, modules, and even general configuration, all of that actually took place early on and will save a lot of more time for your theming and you could actually content, uh, migrate your content early on. So having a fully proto function prototype easily demonstrate your responsive behavior. Um, so let's say we have an event or a table. You could easily see what things would collapse ahead of time as opposed to waiting later on. So you could use your functional prototype to get buy-in from your team because you have actually collaborate and talk to them about it faster and they get what is going on and you could get buy-in from your clients since they understand what's going on, they understand what the functionality is so they could actually give their approval in a timely manner and you could do usability testing up front. All right, so we have some key takeaways from this presentation that we would like you for, to, rem to remember. The first is smart, start with a small project first. It's easier to manage, and if all else fails, you can recover from it quickly. Keep communication open. So this is a collaborative process. This is gonna be a little bit different than a traditional siloed process. You're gonna be talking a lot more. So make sure that you're keeping those communication lines open. That might mean, mean, that might mean working sessions with a developer if you're a UXer, or a design you know, working session with a UXer, or we all just get together and hash out more stuff after we've done the wireframing when we iterate upon the prototype. This is also a great way to establish collaboration as a company culture. So you have new staff, bring them into sketching sessions. Uh, we've done this with a couple of new people. They had, you know, they weren't UXers. We had them, you know, come in and wireframe with us. They had no idea about UX and they loved it. Um, and it's just a great way to prepare them for when it's their turn to sketch, that they're ready for it. And the biggest thing is that you need to remember that this is a process and to be adaptable. So when we first tried this out, we started small. I actually didn't give anyone any background information. I was worried that it was gonna give them tunnel vision as to what they were gonna create. And um, then after that, I realized that you know, people were hesitant to sketch because they were like, I don't really know what's going on. I wanna make sure I'm doing this right. So I provide a lot of background information. So every time we've done the sketching process, we've taken lessons learned and applied that to our next sketching session. And being adaptable really helps. So part of being collaborative is being adaptable. And that could be anything from as small as, you know, someone doesn't want to sketch with marker, they want to use pencil instead. You know, that's cool. But it also could be something bigger that the timeline shifts. You know, for example, you might need an extra sketching session uh, or maybe an extra discussion session. So being adaptable is really important in order to make this work. The more adaptable you are, the more this process is going to work for your company. And that wraps it up. Um, if you guys have any questions, um, feel free to ask. You can come up to the microphone and ask. Um. Hi. Oh. It's not on. <laughs> Do you? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Have you ever involved your clients? in the sketching discussions? Um, so far we haven't, and part of it, it's we wanna make sure that we know what we're doing ourselves, and sometimes a lot of clients start to dictate things, and as we started this process, everyone's still getting comfortable with themselves to end up discussing. The, the minute you bring a client in, everyone's demeanor changes. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, so I had a question on the whole sketching process. Are you, you're involving everyone on the team for a particular project when you get together to sketch. 
Is that is that right? Yes. So it will we'll have we have a cross functional team. So it's usually a front end designer ba- or a front end developer, back end um, yeah. a designer, maybe two designers, a UXer, depending on how big the project is. But basically, whole the entire team, like content strategist, everyone. Even like project manager. And, yes. Okay. So, you know, presum- presumably one of you has more experience or expertise in the whole idea of of UX. And I was just curious what, if you, how it benefits your team to have everyone producing sketches versus uh, maybe just one person doing sketches and then maybe asking the team for some feedback. Well, so that's a really good question. Um, You know, this is a great way for us to get to know a little bit about how we all do our jobs. So, for example, um, you know, I'm not a developer, so I'm not up on all the latest modules, but Kat is. So when she's sketching, she might sketch in a module that she's just heard about that she thinks is going to be really great for the site. Or Ika, who's a designer, knows some design tips that I don't really know. So we'll go ahead and collaborate all those ideas. So even though like they're not UXers by heart, they do know a lot of information, and they're great resources, and they bring a lot of ideas to the table. This is a follow-up to that first question. Can you talk a little bit more about at what points in this process the you're showing things to the client, and at, one, at what point they review it and sign off? For example, do you? I know you, you don't bring the client into the sketching process, but do you show them the sketches at all? So uh, it varies based on our relationship with the client. Some clients want to see something a little bit more formal, so we might hold off until we see the prototype. At times, if uh, we're producing some lo-fi reference uh, wireframes as a result of this, we'll certainly show them at that point. But uh, the main thing we're trying to get at is uh, what the goals of the client are and how we're going to serve that by showing it to them. So if we're demonstrating a lot of interactivity, then we're probably going to wait until the prototype so that we can show them really how it's going to work. But if it's more informal and we're trying to say we think it would be a great idea for you to pull some of this content up and surface it on your home page or on these other pages, then showing them a sketch gets them on that page faster. It's not formalized in terms of when we're going to show them things, but it's usually uh, at the prototype phase always and uh, often a couple of reference documents before that when needed. And can you also say a little bit about usability testing and where that fits in? So our usability testing process tends to come in when we have a functional prototype. We don't usability test our our sketches, but we do try to usability test when the contract calls for it with the prototype as much as we can, and that's dictated by the contract that we have. So we've had a lot of success with walking people through that uh, in the same way that they would interact with the site. It lets you get a lot of that data much sooner than you ordinarily would and in a more meaningful way than when you're using like a clickable PDF. Great, thank you. Do you have any ideas on how you would handle the sketching process with a fully remote team? <laughs> I would imagine that would be challenging. Uh, we, don't, we haven't had to implement that with a fully remote team because we are working in the office with the exception of uh, some back-end developers. So uh, the sketching has been uh, in person. I imagine you could do something like a, like screen sharing to put that together and work in something, a uh, prototyping tool. There are quite a few out there. But uh, since we're trying to keep things more informal, it's not a challenge we've had to tackle yet. Thank you. So with these projects, are they um, project-based or are they hourly? How are you, have you noticed like a change that going over budget because you have such a collaborative team? How does that work? So we actually, we uh, have a mix. Sometimes they're hourly and sometimes they're project-based. Mm-hmm. But what we've found, uh, <laughs> if anyone wants to contribute, what we've found on that is uh, primarily that we're front-loading a lot of the work we would have been doing anyway. Mm-hmm. So while we are having a lot of these um, discussion sessions, as you can see, a lot of that time is time that we would have spent getting people up to speed later in the project anyway. So we have people in the room um, who are contributing and kind of forestalling problems that would have been spent afterward. Our accessibility analysts, for example, get to contribute early and say, you're going to want to watch out for this, as opposed to doing an extensive review later and finding a lot of problems they need to document and then work with us to fix. So our idea is that we're not creating additional work. We're front-loading work that would have been done in the later stages anyway. Perfect. Thanks. Um, I've, I've worked on a lot of projects where there's a lot of similarities. Um, do you guys find yourselves using some things over and over again from project to project and kind of recycling things? Um, h- how do you work between 
keeping things siloed from project to project or being just being more efficient and saying, hey, we, we used this in the past and it's a good solution and we're going to use it again? I think that's actually helped by having more people in the room when you're doing this because what we're bringing to it is the knowledge of the solutions that we've used in the past. Uh, we know, for example, we've gotten really experienced with um, maps and calendars lately, so we're not going to re re reimagining how they work every time when we do need to use a calendar or a map. We tend to use previous projects as reference points when it comes down to actually blocking that out. But uh, pulling in different layout elements, we're trying not to be constrained as much by what we've done previously and be open to new ideas while relying on previous solutions when they've been time tested and shown to work well. Do you, uh, do you package any of that into like a feature that you could then transport from site to site? For we have not been packaging any of it into a feature at this point. Uh, we do have, sometimes we'll produce uh, modules during the process of uh, working on previous sites. We might take a module we produced and plug it in to move forward. But uh, we don't tend to use features to create new content types, for example, or to pass views from site to site, because generally speaking, um, these things have been pretty unique to the project. It would be hard for us to apply, for example, uh, something we came up with for the FTC Drupal prototyping process to the Commission of Fine Arts because it's wildly different contents and different goals. Okay, thanks. Okay. Hogging the mic. <laughs> quick question on. <clears throat> let me try that again. Uh, quick question on migration. Um, what happens in situations where you don't have, uh, say, you're moving from unstructured information to structured, where you can't actually migrate it, or there's been a strategic change in direction on what they want? And so the, the content they had before really isn't relevant. So that's always, it's always painful on any project when you're going to be making a big uh, migrational shift like that. What we found is that doing this has actually made it easier for us to communicate with our clients, when we, especially when we have a large migration effort, but their content isn't going to map one-to-one, -one because that allows us to see what we're going to need to do in order to get the, migra to get the content in the site. And uh, it also we get to work with them on how they're going to be working in a new content management system as opposed to in a static site. So for the prototype purposes, we're only moving over a few pieces of content for each content type. So uh, copying and pasting and mapping it to fields is not really that terribly painful a process, although it's, of course, easier if you have a, some sort of structured data you can pull from. But having these conversations during this prototype phase as opposed to assuming, yeah, it's all going to come in and it's going to be fine. We're just going to script it. Uh, is makes things a lot easier later because you're realizing how much of a change your content is going to have to go through in order to make it in. When they're writing content from scratch, it really pays to have your client understand what it is that they need to provide for you at this point and how their content's going to change. And uh, if you have a content strategy phase on your project, which hopefully you do, your content strategist is a huge, huge resource during this time. Got it. Thanks. So uh, the biggest prototyping tool that we've been using lately is uh, Drupal. I, I don't know if, uh, sorry, that's a terrible answer. Uh, what we've been using is mostly just laying the, setting up the site building the way that we're going to want it to function ultimately on the site. I know uh, we've used some other prototyping tools in the past, but we've found that they, uh, they haven't communicated the interaction on the back end as much as we've wanted. We haven't been able to create those dynamic relationships. And ultimately, uh, we are not huge fans of creating throwaway projects. So, I'm sorry? What about wireframes that you might Okay, um, the question uh, was, uh, what about wireframing tools? Uh, Michelle, you want to take that one? Sure. Um, so I've been use just using the sketches as what we keep as a record, and then I'll annotate with post-it notes. So I don't actually use software. Sometimes if things are more complicated, we'll use OmniGraffle. I found that's been really um, helpful. They've got a whole nice stencil pack. Um, so that's primarily what we use, but we try to throw things into the prototype, into a, like a Drupal prototype as soon as possible. Uh, one, sorry, uh, one quick note on that. There was a session yesterday, if you're really interested in um, prototyping and, uh, in wireframing tools. Uh, it was wireframing smarter, and uh, the, he had a lot of, hey, there's my login screen. He had a lot of uh, great suggestions for tools that you can use. I think the video of that is online now, if you want to check it out. Okay, so the question is what modules we use to help in the prototyping process. Go to the microphone, Lauren. 
Uh, and we've been using a lot of different modules that have helped out with that. As I mentioned, um, special menu items has been helpful for building out the menu really quickly. We use views, obviously. Uh, I really prefer context for block associations because it makes things more straightforward. And uh, I, uh, we spend actually a lot of time importing content with feeds uh, when we need to rather than uh, if scripting it isn't a graceful option. Any other questions? Okay, thanks so much. Thank you.